Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I have to say, I just recently moved back to Berlin uh, after 16 years in California, which may explain the weird mix of German accent and Americanisms that you're about to um, experience. Um, why don't we do a very brief uh, round of just explaining what you do, uh, Aisha? Sure. Um, I'm Aisha Yildin, as Vice President in New Devices Group in Intel, and I'm primarily responsible for um, wearable strategy in business, as well as makers and pro-makers. Perfect. Hi, I'm Kerstin Günther. I'm engineer by profession and heart. Uh, I'm leading the, I'm, I'm responsible for technology and IT in Europe for Deutsche Telekom and new also now the managing director of our pan-European new company. Uh, Lars Simrichs, uh, big DOD fan uh, for over 10 years now. Um, definitely my, my company Zing, some people have heard about <laughs> it and I'm now building uh, private, uh, private equity companies and uh, the smart home, the smartest home of all. And I'm Jackson Bond. Uh, I used to work at Xing, actually, uh, a long time ago. Um, I'm head of product and marketing at, and co-founder of Relayer. Uh, Relayer makes uh, products for the Internet of Things, building solutions and connecting things very easy for companies to do. Um, that's it. Thanks so much. So uh, it's, it's clear that the Internet of Things uh, some people like Cisco call it the internet of everything, uh, is going to be a big deal. The, the predictions, as always, are all over the place. Ericsson expects 50, 50, 50 billion devices to come online by 2020. Um, Intel is a little more conservative with 31 billion, and Gartner even more so with 26 billion. But definitely, it, it is going to be uh, changing all of our lives. The Pew Center had a very interesting survey last year uh, where mo most experts uh, surveyed said um, there's going to be widespread and beneficial effects of the Internet of Things by 2025. Now, that's a long way out. Let's look at Germany, Hamburg in October. There's going to be your house coming online, Apartimentum. Ex let us give us a couple of examples, please, of what it can do thanks to sensors and smart technology. Maybe before we, we enter this kind of what it does have is it's not just a, an, uh, it's not just a house, it's a, a new product. So in the history of the rental market, nothing has changed in the last 70 years. And so it's always about square meters, it's about number of rooms, uh, location and infinite uh, agreement for, to rent. But you're not only getting an empty um, apartment, you're also getting 14 contracts uh, like uh, internet, uh, heating, electricity, and et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to get the next step, and smart things is one example, you have to create a new product with a new characteristic. So in the apartmentum in, in Hamburg, it's about square meters of living quality in the best location for a limited time for a flat fee. So everything is included. Flat fee, maybe to start there, the biggest second cost or variable cost in, in houses are uh, electricity or the bill to the utility company. And my strong belief is that you can transform this extra cost uh, to a revenue stream um, which is in a flat rate uh, reducing uh, the amount and making it more profitable. And this works if you have intelligence in the entire home so that the home knows what time is it and if someone is there or not. So if nobody's there, basically you can switch everything off. How does it know and what is it going to offer me when I either leave or when I come back? Let's start at the entry uh, situation. Uh, we designed uh, together with um, one German startup, one AIM, and a um, company which is uh, located here in Bavaria, Scharkhuber, the most intelligent door. So we, we actually built a, a smart door, which uh, you can enter with your phone. You no, no longer keys are needed. The door tracks if you're outside or inside. The doors know. Um, if it's, for instance, after 7 o'clock, the lights are ringing and no longer the um, alarm uh, bells of the children waking up. If you're not there, you can uh, receive a 
like a call from your door, can communicate with the person, uh, you can offer one-time uh, security keys, um, or if you're away, you can just open f remotely the door. So once the door is smart, the, um, the apartment actually knows if there's someone inside or no. If there are many people inside and the door tracks actually how many people get in, you make the active um, um, air hydration higher and higher. So there's lots of things which are interconnected, or if you enter uh, or leave the apartment, the door is connected uh, to the elevator, so the elevator immediately comes. So all things which makes living much more enjoyable, uh, the house reacts to your needs and your services, and what w uh, I call it instant comfort, and this is, mm -hmm. it's a new type of apartment. Okay. Um, I'm going to go get to you, um, Jackson, in a moment, but the, the, the obvious question here is so many sensors that want to, uh, and devices that need to talk to each other, etc., um, that only works if we have infrastructure in place. Sure. Um, I guess for me, the network is everything. Without the network, nothing can work. Take the example you have all the iPhones. Well, you don't care about the network. But once the network is down, and also the sensors, then the iPhone just becomes an iPod. Well, the good thing is that it holds for several days, the but the uh, other thing, you cannot use it really. So the same as everything was explained by, by Lars. If you don't have a mobile coverage, if you don't have fiber to the home and even to all the, the rooms, nothing will work. Yeah? Then all the intelligence will be gone. Um, and I think here, the future is IP. We have our Deutsche Telekom, and uh, maybe that's also Im an important thing. Since we know that IP is the future, we need to shut down all our legacies. There are so many uh, rubbish old equipment in, in, in our network, which does not enable us seamless provisioning, all the, the speaking of sensors to each other. And we have here, let's say I'm, I'm really proud, because we were the first ones of switching off a whole, in a whole country, the old legacy, and going to IP, which is in Macedonia. We would ask, where's Macedonia? Far, far away, just a few customers, and who cares about them? But another thing, we keep our plan, and last year, we switched off the next country, a larger one, with five million inhabitants, which is Slovakia. So just imagine, in two countries in Europe, we have already all IP, we have fiber, and what it means, you can do everything seamlessly. You, you have, we have a product out there which is called uh, Video On Demand, TV On Demand. Um, if, you, if you order your TV on Friday, you said, I want to have it, we switch it on, and if you are gone from your weekend house, you switch it off again. So that's the future, that's IP. There are these nice visions of you know, the paper towel dispenser saying, hey, please, I need a refill. Uh, or one of my favorites is the, the vision of the umbrella network that says, hey, you forgot your umbrella over there. What are the, what are the things that are necessary in general uh, for this to happen? I assume all IP is one of them. Standards would be another one. You're going to have lots of sensors uh, in, in an apartment. Oh, and this also, as Kassin said, everything is going to be IP. IP is the main protocol for the home. Not just in the network, it's also everything inside. So the idea of the smart home is there for the last 15 years, but everything uh, like the network is on legacy system, like KNX, IEB bus, M bus, CAN bus. There are so many proprietary systems. And the great thing with all the IP migration also inside the, the devices is that the price gets down to a fraction. It's like one tenth in, in general. And uh, this by much more comfort. So the main, main important things is definitely security. It's about energy con controlling, lighting. And if you just uh, have those, those three elements, there are so many more assistant uh, systems which are c talking to each other. And the great thing about IP is everybody can talk to each other. And this is basically what, what you are also doing. Well, thanks for the intro, Lars. <laughs> um, indeed, yes. <clears throat> um, but I think 
when you're talking about Internet of Things, uh, so yes, we are trying to create an agnostic, interoperable platform, a middleware, if you will, that will enable um, any device to connect to each other. Um, and we've got a, a variety of different devices already in our platform that allows you to connect them together the way you want to. If you're a company building your own solution or if you're a young, a young developer or an entrepreneur trying to create a new uh, smart solution, you might use our platform to connect different things for that purpose. But I think uh, coming back to the Internet of Things um, and the, the German term Industry 4.0, um, and I think we were talking about it before. No one really knows where Industry 3.0 was. <laughs> Maybe some of you do. Uh, but Industry 4.0 and Internet of Things, I think what we've been learning since we launched uh, our, our primary product uh, last October is we're being approached by a lot of companies who we're now working with, large and small. So big global uh, conglomerates to all the way down to startups. But the pattern is always the same. Internet of Things is a very broad topic. It's very hard to grasp. It's very hard to, to create something concrete in your mind. It's very general. And what we end up doing is helping a company zero in on two or three interesting use cases for them and help them build it within a few hours. So what we do is we provide an interoperable platform, a cloud platform, but also the tools in that platform that allow the company to build their first solutions. And that's what we've, you know, whether it's a pharmaceutical company that we work with, or a large global appliance manufacturer that we work with, or multiple consulting, global consulting companies that we work with. Um, in every case, it's the, same, it's the same problem. We all want to do Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. How do we start? And we say, look, don't worry about it. Start small, build something, and launch quickly, and learn from that. In fact, um, there's a quote, a great quote, from uh, Michael Ziesemer. I think I'm pronouncing him, his name correctly. Michael Ziesemer von Zwei, von Zentral, I'm going to get this right, Zentral Verband für Deutsche Ingenieur, or Elektroingenieur. That's close enough. Something like that, electronic, <laughs> something like that. So, so he said it, uh, he was quoted in FATS a few weeks ago saying, saying, the industry has to wake up. We have to innovate. We can't do it in years, in months. We have to do it every day. And he said, he literally said, quote unquote, start small, learn from that, and build your first solutions. And don't worry about the end goal yet. Learn and figure out what works before you start. And that's what our tools en enable to connect these devices and, and create solutions. We're going to get a demo in a moment, but Kathleen, you wanted to. Yeah, for this in. uh, Industry 4.0, Internet of Things. So, um, let me give an example. Um, the human being, you know, the reaction of human being is like um, if you do something, if you're driving a car and the car in front of you stops, yeah, then it takes you one second until. Your brain tells your food to react, push the brake, and then it's one second. So it's the human being interactions. This is not enough. And in this one second, actually, the car, when you drive with 100 uh, kilometers an hour, goes another 28 meters. Yeah? So this is reaction time. Now, in the future, tactile internet, when sensors talk with each other, yeah, then it can be only milliseconds. Yeah? So we cannot speak about the reaction time of humans anymore. And this is, for me, Internet 4.0, or the new tactile internet. So we need to have new ways, new technologies, in order to support this new revolution, which will happen in order to have immediate reaction. Yeah? Right. But to start, to start building something, the Internet of Things, I think, for most people, it's, it's a quite a, a hard topic to grasp. But it's basically nothing more, if you think about it, it's nothing more than sensors connected to the Internet. At the very core, it's sensors connected to the Internet, and you having the ability as a human being to see that data and react and do something with that data and make decisions, more intelligent decisions using that. So maybe I'll just show the... the Give us a, and then Aisha can tell us how, how we make this non-geeky so that everybody can use it. But uh, let's have a quick demo first, please. I just want uh, a like very quick demo. What, so one of the things that we created... One of the things that we created was, of course, the platform, but we, we realized when talking to people building solutions, they need easy tools. And one of those tools, because the Internet of Things is all about sensors, we created a platform and we created actual sensors um, for, for rapid prototyping solutions. And we have, it, you know, we have it up there. So what I've got here is our, our, one of our core products called the Wonder Bar, which is a prototyping tool we call Internet of Things 
kit, starter kit for app developers. Um, I can't hold it up because the sensor's in here, but basically it looks like this. So it's a little piece of chocolate. And if you look at the, uh, if you look at the gyroscope accelerometer, that's the green box behind me, you can see if I move like this, it's going to start moving pretty crazy. Like this. Um, if I take, this is maybe more interesting, if I take this light color proximity sensor right here and I hold it against my, I'll get some DLD red. Let's see if I can get the DLD red. There's DLD red. Do you see that red dot? I can also hold it to the blue and get a little bit of blue. Let's see, hold on. Yeah, there you go. It depends on where you hold it. A little blue. Um, we have, uh, let's see here, Lars, maybe you can help me out here. If you just take, let's test your breath. Oh. Here, <laughs> breathe on that sensor. Everyone watch the humidity in the middle. See how, how good Lars's breath is. Oh, it's pretty good. 91% good. OK, excellent. <laughs> so so, so giving, basically giving sensors that you can immediately take and use that are already connected to the internet. You don't have to program them. You just simply take them. And this is what the companies are doing. They're saying, of course, it's all about sensors. Just give us the sensors, and we can build the solutions like that. No, Aisha, that's a sweet bit of technology, but uh, it's not going to taste very good if engineers design for other engineers. How do we prevent that from happening? What, what do people need to keep in mind? Um, we need to start talking. That's what we need to do. Um, you know, I come from a, a silicon company, obviously Intel, for a number of years, 40 over 40 years so far. Um, and when we decided to get into this new devices thing, which is the sensors and the Internet of Things and what have you, um, we said, okay, let's take a different approach, which is let's go out um, to the people who actually have been making things that we wear and things that we interact for hundreds of years, not just the past 20 years. So um, I kind of want to talk about, okay, so we're imagining a 50 billion thing world by 2025 or 2020, whatever, whomever you ask for it. Um, imagine there's going to be 7 billion people by that time, and 50 billion things is a lot of things. So there's a couple of basic assumptions that it, actually we made when we started this journey. We said, um, number one, um, usage model is everything. So it's, it's very interesting to have a bunch of things that, has, that tells you how many steps you take every day. And that's probably good for a bunch of people in California and probably in Western Europe, but for the rest of the world, um, I think we have some ways to go to enrich and to differentiate people's lives as to how they interact with sensors, how they interact with technologies, what does it really do for them is remaining a big question. The second thing I think is that, you know, how do we as humans actually interact with all these things? And, you know, we humans do not necessarily like awfully complicated, sophisticated things to use and wear. Um, I'll give you a one little example, and then I'll go to the way out there feature, which is the little device that I'm wearing. It's called Mika. Um, we enabled a fashion company out of New York City. Um, they're called Opening Ceremony. And it was an amazing experience. Imagine this huge tech, you know, technical company sitting together with a fashion house who have no idea how to design anything technical. And we've done this in nine months or so. And there was amazing you know, learnings where, as an example, the first time we've done this, um, it was much thicker. It, it was more like a rectangle. And I don't know, as a woman, if I would ever wear it. And they said, no, 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 we need it thinner and we need it rounder. And by the way, um, what is that whole screen at the top of it? No woman wants to know anybody that they're actually wearing a wearable on them. We're like, oh, OK. So we had to hide it inside. So there's all these human interactions about how we're talking to technology that we're trying to um, accumulate and understand so that it becomes organic and natural for people. So I'll give a way out there um, feature. And I think all the use cases my colleagues are talking about are very good and functional. By the way, one more thing I learned in the past two years is that function is not everything. It's aesthetics that matter. If you are to actually put something on you or interact with it, you do want it to be really um, aesthetically pleasable and beautiful and what have you. All the other things of life that makes us humans and women and men and whatever we are. Um, but um, this proof of concept we've done, I do want to talk about, that we have shown in Consumer Electronics Show last year. It's basically a, a always-on simple Bluetooth um, headset. And you put it on you, and what it does is that 
It tries to keep a track of your history. So in other words, it kind of knows who you are. And imagine you wake up in the morning, you start driving to work, and um, it happens to know your calendar, and it also happens to know that you have a teleconference starting at 9 o'clock, and it knows that I'm driving from San Francisco to Palo Alto. The traffic will be awful. And then it says, by the way, on the way to work, remember, um, it's your assistant's birthday today, and you do need to pick up um, flowers. So with this rate, that tra traffic, you'll be totally missing your teleconference call. So it kind of knows um, the important dates in your life and your route that you take the past, I don't know, year or six months and what have you, and has access to what you intend to do that day and takes an algorithm. Now, this is incredibly difficult. The example I gave you is probably an out there example, which is it requires speech recognition, it requires artificial intelligence, it requires for something to be able to talk back to you, um, what have you. There's probably eight to 12 different um, algorithms and technologies of AI that needs to be implemented in this. And in every single segment of your life, you need to be able to create that. Are we ever gonna get there? I think so. I think so, um, and it's going to take a while, but certainly there's thousands and thousands of engineers um, trying to make this what I just gave the example of a reality. I think the more important question is going to be when we have all this wonderful infrastructure and the apps and the you know connectivity that my colleagues are talking about and these devices that I'm talking about are making, um, what are we going to do with them as, as humans? And are they really going to make a difference in our lives? And what is the really right um, killer app, the use model, the organic normal thing? Um, what is it going to be? Is it voice? Is it uh, the form factor that matters? Is it a little chip that I'm going to put on my um, shirt or on my shoe? Or is it still going to be this big phone that I'm going to carry around me and keep looking at it every day? I think those are the big questions as technology and people will have to journey through. Well, we kind of know that glasses don't really seem to work, at least for now, um, thinking about Google. Um, but I'm wondering, where do you see the biggest beneficial applications uh, coming in the near future, Jackson? Well, maybe I can report a little bit from some of the customers we're helping. So applications, real life applications are sort of, are sort of the core, uh, uh, sort of the core of this uh, to make it really understandable. So I'll give you a, a, a big industrial example. So there's a, a printing press manufacturer working with, and they have a lot of legacy equipment. So they're talking about, sense, uh, talking about equipment that's you know, half as big as this room. Basically, they're large, large old uh, uh, high-tech uh, uh, devices, if you will, full of sensors. But the sensors are are not connected to the internet, oddly enough, mm -hmm. or not oddly enough, because they were built and designed several years ago, and they have a lifetime of say 20 years. And there's a lot of legacy equipment out there in German industry as well as obviously American industry, and they want. So if you can imagine, they want to be able to benefit from the Internet of Things. They want to be able, for example, to sit anywhere in the world and be able to look at an app and see what those machines are doing and what the state of those machines mm -hmm. is. Right? But they can't do that today. They have to take a computer, an actual laptop, go to the machine individually. Uh, there's about 100,000 around the world. Go to these um, machines individually, take the data, download the data, take the data back to uh, the other computer, put all that data in the computer, and then start crunching it for that computer. Right? Um, and then hopefully the other people around the world and the other 100,000 sites have done that too. Mm -hmm. Now, that's extremely costly and time inefficient. Um, and what they did is they, took, they started to take sensors that we provided, prototype sensors, and attach these sensors that were connected to the internet where they could build an app in a few days and actually see the data from these machines, not inside, not yet, but outside, so they could see temperature, they could see sound, they could see movement, they could see humidity. It's a printing press, so humidity is, mm -hmm. of course, really important. And they could suddenly, because the data is already connected to the internet, they could see and sit anywhere in the world and look at that machine in that machine room and see what was happening. That data then they could track and model and predict based on what's happening inside the machine, how that correlates directly to, say, um, uh, error rates. Mm -hmm. It's a nice illustration of what uh, Salesforce's chief scientist, J.P. Rogaswamy, called the net effect will be to reduce waste everywhere because everything gets more 
efficient. But still, it feels like we constantly have this promise of tomorrow. And today, um, a lot of it feels a little bit gadgety, or, or we're still not, we're always not there yet. I remember even 15 years ago, there was the vision of the smart house. Um, why is it? What are the big obstacles? In the old days, it was actually doing the wiring uh, and um, using the the old um, home servers and all these kind of things. So, in in the apartmentum, there are over 40 smart things built in, or smart uh, 40 smart services. So it's uh, from the time you wake up, you're going to be connected or have the alarm clock of your phone connected to the light. You get artificial lighting, which makes you awake. And if, if it's much more earlier, then the heating is immediately on in the bathroom. You select uh, your bath program to energize and not relaxing. Uh, technology um, done by Dornbach. So if you then enter the living room, everything is set up uh, with the light which is needed uh, to, to light up uh, the room. The door knows uh, when you're going away, if there's someone still left. If you go to the elevator and uh, take the route to your car, the car already has a new software because uh, there is uh, VLAN in the garage. So there are lots of infrastructure things which are then connected in the cloud. So the cloud meaning uh, services like IFTTT, if then, then that. So everybody can program it. So you don't need to call the smart home expert who comes by, reprograms everything, and uh, it costs you something. But what the promise uh, the smart home should have is instant comfort, giving you more time, more relaxation. Same if you go into shopping center, you expect the door to open manually automatically. Why don't you can have this at home? So things which makes your life easier and uh, still having security which is higher than if you don't have it. Are you going to move in first thing in on Are you going to move in yourself first thing in October? <laughs> I have every single gadget you can think of at my home uh, and I'm building a reduction of this uh, now in Apartimentum. But this is still right now, it, it, it costs uh, cost money. But I think in the next five years, with the democratization of IP technology, um, the prices will get down so that more and more people will have the comfort you have in the apartmentum. Sounds nice, Kerstin. Let me take the, the IP, IP again and uh, what hinders us to be faster. Again, I'm coming from the network. For, for me, the network are like the roots of a tree. Yeah? Um, when without those roots, there are no apples and other things out there. Um, but don't forget that we still have old roots in the ground. Kappa. Yeah? The kappa was installed like 50 years ago where we had only voice. Now we want to transport all those data over it, so we need to change um, it to fiber. It costs a lot of money, it was already mentioned. Yeah? We also need to change the technology because just when you have the intelligence into the cloud, you can be much faster, much more efficient. As long as we have still the old technology out there in, in big buildings, in, you know, um, rooms which take a lot of energy, then we will be very, very slow. So that's the issue of technology. But let, let me take also another issue, and most of us are Europeans. Um, my thesis is Europe falls behind in all this. Because why? I mean, look for the US. In the US, we have 300 million inhabitants served by four <laughs> telecommunication providers. In China, you have 1.5 billion served by four. In Europe, we have 300. 300 service providers. In each country, you have four or five, and we have many countries. And we don't have standardization. We don't have the same uh, networks. We don't, have, we don't have the basis for it. So we need to work here in order to be competitive in Europe. We need to work on legislation. Yeah? Not only technology is one thing, legislation is another thing. And then, 
to add on this, who has still a Nokia, Nokia smartphone or handy with you? Oh. Brave. <laughs> two, two. OK. Um, what I'm saying is, where is Europe in this game? In, in the, the handsets, yeah? And everything is produced either in China or, in, uh, or in, in Asia or in the US. The same with the equipment I'm buying. I'm not buying any, Europe, uh, any more Europe equipment, but I'm buying most of the things from Cisco, which is on the one side, and from Huawei on the other side. So I really need to encourage us that we as Europe need to get into the boat again, to drive it, both from the regulatory side, but also from the innovation and the production side. Well, maybe there's an opportunity. Um, <laughs> maybe there's an opportunity for European startups, companies in general, to, to work on something that is clearly uh, going to be of crucial importance uh, in this gigantic market that is forming, namely security. Because this vision of hackers, wherever they may come from, um, wreaking havoc with my uh, 50 devices all around me. They could you know, create any kind of horror scenario from mass break-ins into steering a car that I'm driving into some obstacle. Um, is that, or is that just a layman's fear? I mean, it, it, sound, it, it seems to stand to reason that whatever is connected can be hacked and will be hacked. Uh, yeah, actually, I wanted just to quickly answer or talk about what she, w what Kerstin was talking about, the innovation culture, because I think, I think thankfully, uh, in the last two or three years, you've seen a radical shift in the innovation culture in, in Germany. I can't speak for Europe at large, but um, just what we've been doing, participating in so-called hackathons. Some of you might know what a hackathon is. It's when a bunch of developers get together. It's sort of a party. Uh, there's usually a sponsor behind it, and then... This uh, is the good kind of hacking. Good, good kind of hacking, right. They're basically developers or, or entrepreneurs who get together, and, and they have technical uh, savvy and skills, and they build stuff in 28, 24 to 30 hours. Um, and so we provide our kits, and they build stuff. Um, and three years ago, there were maybe, I don't know, five, five hacks, hackathons a year. And now you have, I think just in the last year, we've been to 50 hackathons. 50 hackathons, each one around 100 developers. That wasn't the case three years ago. And so what's happening is, I think you, you're finally getting the shift um, across Europe where creative individuals, entrepreneurs are getting together, funded and sponsored by big companies who want to push innovation. So most of these are, I've been to hackathons sponsored by banks. I've been to hackathons uh, sponsored by logistics companies, by railway companies, by obviously telecoms companies. Um, health companies, just a couple weeks ago, appliance manufacturers. I mean, it's just crazy. It's like every weekend you could go to a hackathon if you want. You're probably 10 in Germany every weekend. That, that, that gives us hope. I'd still like to go back to the bad hackers. Okay. What about, what about that vision? How can I be sure that, you know, I'm not... I mean, it's bad enough if my, if my smartphone sure. gets hacked, but what you, about my home, my, my car, my everything? You can't be sure. I that's that, comforting. Yeah. That's yeah, but great. That's, but that was always the case. That was the case with every technological revolution, particularly since the internet. If you if you believe today that you can't be hacked or that you're you know that there's a problem, it's it's never changed. But it didn't matter to my home door. You just didn't know or, it before. You didn't know it my before pacemaker. Snowden. Before Snowden, you didn't know that you were being hacked and watched, and your images were being downloaded. Now you know it, <laughs> right? Now you know it, and that's a good thing. Okay. I think the notion of 100% security is just impossible. Um, the, the biggest security risk is actually between the chair and the table, uh, which are humans. So uh, back at Zing days, uh, we, we looked at what kind of passwords are the users using. And number one, password. Number two, secret. <laughs> number three, quirts. So uh, if you have this kind of um, in basic passwords, which are more and more or less uh, forbidden, but still used, uh, this is the biggest problem. The, the last year, the big iPhone, iCloud scandal was really about uh, you knowing the usernames and just testing out basic products, uh, basic passwords. And this is and then, by, by some people it works, and by some people it doesn't. So, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the problem is really the human being and not the system. 
maybe then biometrics, oh sorry, Kathleen, uh, I was just thinking about biometrics as an alternative to uh, passwords because you told me something about that. Sure, yeah, we, we mentioned that briefly before the conference um, started. Um, there is a way which is apparently, I didn't know this before I started doing this, which is seven billion of us have a different heart rate. Um, and it's not 100% secure in any way, but it, if you actually put a couple of more um, variables into the game and make it much more sophisticated, you could actually um, identify somebody that they are them uh, through their heart rate. And at the same time, my doctor knows whether I'm healthy or not. Perfect. <laughs> I, I always call medical health and art not science, by the way. So this is one of those Perfect. things, right? Yeah. No, security will, is not only a password. I think it is important whether we talk about healthcare or, or other things. Um, let me use two facts. We have, we as Deutsche Telekom, we have one, half a million attacks every day to our network, yeah? which we see on, our, on the border and which we keep away. Yeah? Another fact is that there are in the world 350,000 viruses coming up every day. 350,000 viruses, which we have to cope with. And I believe it cannot be an individual, so you have to rely on, on, on big companies, yeah? on, on standardization and on cloud. I mean, we will have to bring the intelligence together so that we can manage on a more central way the, uh, the, uh, the data which which comes from the outside, where we will be attacked. Of course, um, then you have also the issue, is this secure? But I think it is more secure than all the individual pieces you have out there, and that's why we will have to go IP, we will have to go to cloud, and we will have to do a lot about security, and here again, we will have to do it in Europe and in Germany. The other big um, downside to this wonderful new world, of course, is if everything around me is connected, knows about my every step, my every breath, my every drink that I drink, uh, where, where is privacy at all anymore? I mean, it's, it's nice, especially with e-health, uh, you know, if my doctor constantly knows whether I'm doing fine. But at the same time, of course, my, the, the health insurance would like to know whether I'm drinking maybe one, two beer too many, regularly, et cetera. So, uh, and it's not just that, but in general, it's where we move, what we do, um, everything will be constantly tracked and logged and stored somewhere. How do we deal with this? Anybody? Let me, maybe, I won't, this won't be a direct answer to your question, but I, I actually think this is a great discussion to have as a society, as companies, as individuals, and as governments as to where does the limit start and where does the limit end and what do we want ourselves. And it's, it's a good, I think, cultural societal change that we've been exposed to as humans the past, I don't know, five years, I'll say, since the social media thing just blew up. And um, with my 14-year-old nephew is okay to share everything and anything. I can't imagine wanting to share anything that he does as an individual, but he's okay with it. So I, I, I think we, we'd have to look at this with open eyes to say, well, there's, there's not only technologies making things available, but also there's a cultural change that's happening, which things are much more acceptable and we're okay to give to two or three or say five companies in the world all the information that we have every single day by approving all the apps in our phones. Um, and I think it's a, it's a very healthy, long discussion we collectively need to have as to where does this stop and, and start, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> I was just going to make a quick, quick statement and ask the audience. Um, I guess how many of you all are on social media in terms of data security, right? How many of you are on social media? So basically everyone in the room, anyone who's not on social media. You're, oh, Nokia phone, right? No, 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 I just, just No, so a couple of people are not on social media, but you know, it's about a half a percent. So that right there is, is maybe an answer to uh, how we as a as a collective feel about data security, yes, we have to trust, but we also have to experiment. Mm -hmm. It's a step-by-step -step experimentation, raise questions, criticize, learn, improve, but you have to do that, and it's, that's why it's very good what Snowden did. He exposed the, the weakness that was invisible, and now we know about it, and now most of us are aware of it. 
certainly it, it is extremely important, um, and, and there need to be laws and regulations, yeah? But we also need to see all the advantages coming up, and, uh, you know, I think on the one side, it's also a cultural issue. I'm traveling a lot, and when, when, when I'm in Africa, uh, the people use, you know, there's nothing, they, they have their handy and they do everything with this, yeah? All money transfer, everything, yeah? So I'm not saying that they don't care, but they are really dependent on it, and they, um, see it more as a as a daily issue. Or a daily, so, also in, in in other countries in Europe, um, it's of course security is an issue. And even if you ask young people, for them it, it's becoming more and more important. Even if they use all the social media, but it's it's a kind of culture. I think we, we talk too much and we are too much afraid sometimes in Germany, where others try and 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 and. Um, test it out. So we need to find a way. On the one side, we need to do regulation and think about how we protect ourselves. Yeah, But on the other side, we all know that it is extremely important. We heard about all the, the medical um, um, things which will happen. A lot of them will depend on transferring data yeah? to, 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 get, uh, to get help. Um, will require also the, the balance between giving up some rights, but on the other side, protecting rights. Well, maybe we all need brain implants for a cultural reset button. Um, <laughs> I'd like to close with uh, the outlook. Five years from now, ten years from now, what will be normal in our lives? Um. Let, let me continue being centered around the human and how we deal with technology. I, I actually do believe, if Germans call it 4.0, you know, Americans call it something else, I, I'm not so sure. Ultimately, there is a revolution happening, which is technology, um, there, there, is this, there is this sentence which is um, everybody, anybody can actually express themselves in the world today, which was not possible five or ten years ago, which is a big deal, right? We started talking. As seven billion people, we keep expressing what we think. I think the reason why I'm calling it a revolution of the future is imagine a day when we start making what we want to make rather than just expressing what we think or how we feel about things. So um, it is what I think Jackson was talking about exactly, which is this ability to um, do small prototypes and take things and just make it right away. And it's the 3D printing capabilities. It's the chips that are getting smaller with all these sensors becoming a hub on them. I'll give you a little example. I brought this. Um, this is called the Edison platform. Um, we did this last year. This is as intelligent um, as a computer, say, seven years ago or so. You remember the Pentium computers? It, this is it. It is this small. Um, and then this year, we will be coming out with Curie, which is even smaller. And it'll be so little that it's going to get into anything you wear or wearables, what have you. Back um, in California, but it, um, you know, um, Gordon Moore says, thank you very much. I was right. Yes, <laughs> we, we all proved he's been right, I think, so far. It's getting smaller and more intelligent. And there's going to be sensor hubs in there um, that some of these things that uh, Jackson showed will be uh, naturally, you will be able to embed it. I'll give you examples. Um, we launched this in Rome, uh, Maker Fair, I think two years ago and in, in Europe. And the kids got this, and literally, they're eight to 12-year-old kids, and one of them um, came up with these little um, spiders that know that you're around, then they know how to go back and come forward, and as you get close to them, they have proximity sensors, as an example. Um, we did this competition called Make It Wearable. Three people, just three people company out of UK, they've done a prosthetic hand um, for a kid that, that lost his arm, um, in an incredibly cheap way, and they printed the arm out of a 3D, put this little intelligent thing inside it, and the kid was able to move his arm, which cost tens of thousands of today if, if you actually want to do this. So, um, a third example. Um, this um, kid from India, I think he was 12, um, he managed to do a printer which actually reads a bray for visually impaired people. And imagine how expensive a bray printer is. He just did it in, in a matter of this little 50 bucks thing and you know a couple of other stuff that's needed and connected right away. So I actually think for the first time, and um, I listened to Mohammed Yunus, the normal uh, laureate, 
a um, couple of years ago where he said, for the first time in human um, history, the young people have a tool to really change the world in 5,000 years for the first time. So I, I think we are about to witness this, which is very, very exciting. Fantastic. What else? So I think uh, what came over is we are really in a revolution. Well, Internet of Things, etc. So what I think in five years we will have, at least for Deutsche Telekom, we will have all networks IP. That's at least our target. So in order to be able to, to enable everything what was said before. What we also will have in five years is a pan-European network. That's what I'm standing for, which will enable us, whatever product we introduce in one country, we can roll it out much faster in the other countries. And I also believe in, in five years we will have the next generation already after LTE and 4G, the frequencies which were just sold for a lot of money here in Germany, we will have 5G, which is the basis for tactile internet so that we can, that the, the, the things can communicate with uh, each other immediately. So not with the reaction times of humans which we have right now, but with the, with the immediate action. So mm -hmm. from a technology point of view, those three things, I believe. Very good. We're, we're living in, in the world of the second machine age. So everything gets faster, there's endless computing power, there's endless um, saving um, or data available. And the more uh, we, we think about our um, uh, devices. This is right now the, the key uh, for everything. And I think uh, in, the, in the future it's the variables, the smart things, uh, the, everything is going to be interconnected. And this is maybe something you don't no longer use. It's about your identity which is in the cloud being connected to everything. And everything at your fingertips on devices, on surfaces, in outdoors, indoors, everything. So in this kind of super connected world we're living in, the greatest opportunity here is actually that it's not just about the three billion which are connected now, it's about the seven billion people on the planet being connected. Five years is too far out. I think three years is more realistic. Three years, it's about self-empowerment. It's about empowering individuals. I see, so the way we have phones uh, as our tools, the way we have hammers and screwdrivers as our tools, um, I think you'll be going down to a hardware store and you'll be picking up your sensors that you need. And you might get a call from your wife or husband and say, oh, could you pick me up a temperature sensor? I need a temperature sensor. Or I need a humidity sensor, a gas sensor. And you'll take a gas sensor, a humidity sensor from the hardware store, five bucks, and stick it where you need to stick it, what you want to measure, and you'll see the data and you'll be able to use that. You'll be able to use and control your own data because ultimately the only way a revolution can really take off is when we can all have access to these little tools to actually begin to use them and understand how they benefit our lives. And I think that's what's going to happen in the next two or three years. Very good. No, no question. I think there will be many surprises, hopefully positive. Um, thank you very much for all your input. Uh, and thank you for your attention.